It's just chime noon on the East Coast. Uh, I'm Drew Clark. I'm editor and publisher of Broadband Breakfast and uh, also a former uh, state broadband band initiative leader, which I'll get to in just a moment. I'm also an attorney and I work on telecom and broadband matters. So very excited to welcome you to today's episode of Broadband Breakfast Live Online. Today, we're gonna to be talking with state broadband authorities. And we actually have, uh, we hope five uh, state authorities uh, to be with us. We're still trying to get the, the, the fifth one on the line, but, but for now, um, while I just say a few introductory remarks, I wanted to uh, encourage you to share information about our program with others. If you like uh, Broadband Breakfast Live Online or our, or, or our news, uh, share with others our emails, sign up for our email alerts, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, as well as our social channels, we're active on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and now TikTok. So we look forward to seeing and, and hearing from you in those contexts. Um, I also wanna mention that we, we are here every Wednesday at um, 12 noon Eastern time. We know that's a little bit earlier for some of the people who will be with us today, including Hawaii, but uh, we're here at 12 noon Eastern every Wednesday and next week, we're gonna be talking about billions and billions for broadband, a extremely timely topic given the release of the Biden infrastructure plan today, which we'll probably talk a little bit about today with these state broadband authorities. And then on uh, April 14th, two weeks from today, we're gonna to be talking about less than a billion for broadband, or basically if you are working on developing a broadband plan or a broadband project, what are some of the opportunities and sources for funding for you to tap into. As I stated just a little bit ago, um, I feel a, a kinship towards the, the guests we have on, these program, on this program. All of these uh, four or five people are state broadband authorities, which means that they have some particular mandate or authority from their state government or their state governor to be uh, the lead on broadband topics. Now, my own role in this uh, context was as the State Broadband Initiative Director of Broadband Illinois, or formerly the Partnership for Connected Illinois. This was one of the 56 state broadband initiative entities that was set up as part of the, uh, of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, the Obama era stimulus program that um, uh, included a, a substantial amount of money, $350 million over five years for broadband mapping and planning. And so Broadband Illinois, again, we, we hope we're gonna be hearing from um, uh, 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 Matt Schmidt, who's the, the Illinois um, Broadband Authority, uh, and, and, and we, 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 he'll give us a perspective on what's happening now in, in the, the current era. But in that former era of the state broadband initiatives, these entities uh, had um, a specific mandate from the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which worked with the 56 state broadband initiative entities and collaborated with the Federal Communications Commission. Boy, isn't that strange, collaboration between one federal agency and another, but that did happen and that resulted in an early version of the national broadband map, which subsequently and quickly became dated and flawed and now has kind of revived an interest in broadband mapping and broadband data. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but the point of this is to say that for that period of time when this program under NTIA was active, these state broadband leaders had clear missions and mandates. That said, they could do a lot of different things depending on their state leadership, depending on their governor, depending upon you know, the support they had from the, uh, their legislatures, their state uh, 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 branches of government. And so that in itself uh, created a, a fascinating mix when, when we different state broadband initiative leaders got together. Well, flash forward to the present. Uh, many of these state broadband initiative programs uh, died off when the funding for the program uh, disappeared in 2014, 2015. However, many did stay. And over the last five, six years, we've really begun to see, I think, practically every state, I hope, I hope our guests can, can correct and clarify, but now it's, 
they're back, right? State broad, and they're back in a slightly different guise because it's really been more driven by the states. It's been driven by state leaderships and state governors and state legislators saying, we need this, we have this, and, it, and you know, it did this, and maybe it could have been better at this, but, but it, it got us part of the way there. And now we're gonna hear about the rest of the way there. What is it that these state broadband authorities are doing and what is it that they can do and particularly now that we're seeing a new broadband infrastructure bill and, and plan from the Biden administration, we're going to see a lot more discussion about the interaction that states will have in that context. Well, so that's just my two cents I wanted to say as a, as a kickoff to this. Let me now go ahead and include our, um, our panelist view. Um, and if, if you are... Um, here with us, uh, and, and I've just heard that uh, Matt will be joining very shortly. So thank you for getting that message through. Let's just, again, remind everyone, if you're not in the program, please uh, take your video off and um, we will uh, have, have a good bit of time, we hope, for question and answer after we hear from each of our five state broadband authorities. So we're gonna start uh, based upon the, the, the program that we have on Broadband Breakfast. I'm just gonna say a quick word about each of them and then I'm gonna turn it over to each of them to speak for up to five minutes in this order. We're gonna hear from Scott Rudd, who's the Director of Broadband Opportunities in the Indiana Broadband Office. He will be followed by Teresa Ferguson, the Director of Federal Broadband Engagement in the Colorado Broadband Office. Um, if Matt Schmidt is with us by then, we'll hear from Matt who's the director of the Illinois Broadband Office. We'll just kind of pop him in at the end if he, he isn't in at that time. Then Matt will be followed by, by Kenrick or Rick Gordon, who is the director of the governor's office of rural broadband for, for the state of Maryland. And batting cleanup will be Bert Lum. Thank you for joining us at 6 a.m. in uh, Hawaii. He is the strategic officer for the Hawaii Broadband Initiative. And we've heard that Matt has arrived. So. Go ahead and turn your video on, Matt. There we go. Thank you so much. I've just finished my brief intro of the topic and my interest in it. I'm very, very excited to hear from Matt because of my own prior experience in, in Illinois. But let's go ahead and turn it over without any further ado to Scott Rudd. Uh, give us your thoughts on this very important topic for us today. Drew, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I'm joining you from our local public library, uh, as so many Hoosiers have done over the pandemic to bridge the, the gap in broadband. So if you hear children outside, that's, that's what's happening there. Uh, as Drew said, my name's Scott Rudd, and I'm the director of the Indiana Broadband Office, and I'm uh, joined by Ernie Holtry on the call uh, from my team uh, today. The Indiana Broadband Office uh, was created shortly after the creation of, of my position which is the Director of Broadband Opportunities. And basically the function of that office is to be the single point of contact for Indiana on broadband related items and opportunities. Uh, we manage the Broadband Ready Community Program and uh, really work hard to uh, engage with local communities to foster you know, their leadership, uh, which as we all know is so critical in, in uh, overcoming some of the broadband uh, gaps that exist. Uh, it's really a local effort is the way we approach it in, in Indiana and the state provides significant resources. I'll talk a little bit about those uh, moving forward. So through our efforts over the last you know, couple of years since being established, we've seen an explosion of local engagement and, and leadership teams and broadband ready communities. I think we're over 60 now, we have about 92 counties uh, most of those are counties, but uh, several cities and towns as, as well. And so they've established broadband ready community uh, programs, uh, which expedites deployment and permitting and, and waives fees and creates a point of contact. They've, they've created uh, other leadership task forces that, that engage with providers and build relationships. Um, we've seen significant success in those types of approaches and you know, as we all know, the local communities have, you know, these significant resources such as right-of-ways and the ability to connect with the consumer and, and the residents and businesses at the local level, kind of where the rubber hits the road. So we're really happy with, with, with the level of, of activity there and that continues to grow. 
you know, our office has an incredible set of partners and stakeholders that we bring to the table from Farm Bureau and all the various providers to AARP and, and various state agencies, as well as, you know, Purdue University has been an incredible partner with us. Uh, Roberto Gallardo, just a, 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 a brilliant, uh, you know, broadband researcher and, and more, um, along with some federal uh, uh, help and partnership through NTIA, the National Broadband Availability Map. Uh, the NBAM map, as it's called, that partnership is, is an incredible way for us to both receive and provide data in kind of into a, a single source and map and, and, and has given us, uh, you know, the ability to highlight the needs much more narrowly throughout our state. So, you know, Indiana was, was really ahead of this issue and couldn't be happier pre-pandemic. Our governor and lieutenant governor, Governor Holcomb and Lieutenant Governor Crouch, who I work for, uh, identified this need very early on pre-pandemic and created the state's first uh, broadband grant program and, and, and pumped $100 million into that program uh, called the Next Level Connections a Broadband Grant Program. And this has been a very successful program that to date has, has triggered investment of over $150 million in over 20,000 households and farms and businesses and anchor institutions across our state. Um, happy to report that uh, in the legislative session this year, uh, the governor and, and the legislators are proposing anywhere between 100 million to 250 million more for broadband. Um, so very exciting. Indiana has really has really pushed on this issue for quite some time, and, and now we're we're increasing that that effort even more so. Um, anyone who's been following the broadband for the past year knows that the space is essentially on fire, right? It's been elevated to this point uh, that, that maybe we've never seen before in terms of a priority. We've seen you know, numerous sea change announcements over really the last three to four months that have just been really, really uh, impactful to all the work we, we do. And I know the other panelists can attest to that. In fact, just, just before coming on the panel, I read something about the Biden you know, uh, proposal on infrastructure, $100 billion, just just yet another kind of sea change kind of announcement that, that changes the landscape as we've known it for so long. So just a fascinating time to be in the industry. Um, you know, we've seen the emergency broadband benefit, the FCC leadership change, the numerous federal funding packages, and then our state legislature this year, we've seen more activity legislatively than ever uh, 17, 18 broadband bills uh, being introduced. This is something we've not seen before, talking with all the, the veterans in, in, in our state. Um, those bills cover, you know, really a myriad of, of broadband related needs throughout the state, including increasing our speed thresholds for determining eligibility um, and, and all the way down the pipeline, you know, uh, of, of affordability and all the issues that, that we know to be uh, important to this issue. So, Really, again, just appreciate having you having me on today and look forward to the conversation and, and learning more from some of our other panelists. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for, um, for uh, putting that forward. Let's now turn it over to Teresa Ferguson. G go for it. Uh, many thanks, uh, Drew and Mala, for inviting me to join uh, my fellow uh, broadband colleagues um, for this important conversation today. Colorado's leadership in broadband took root in what Drew was outlining for you all earlier. Uh, under the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, Colorado received, like many states, you know, two million from NTIA and broadband data and development grant funds to map broadband deployment throughout the state. Twelve years later, Colorado continues to rely on that broadband mapping program to identify where broadband is and isn't in our state. The broadband office, our, our Colorado broadband office, or the CBO, which we like to call it, uh, was established in 2016 through an executive order and given the responsibility of coordinating the state's broadband policies across all state agencies that touch broadband. To enable the development of a statewide communications infrastructure through public and private partnerships um, focused directly on meeting the growing demand that we all saw coming, uh, for access um, for all Coloradans. Um, since 2016, we've had some successes. Um, we've increased the number of rural households with access to broadband from 73% to 90%, awarding over 42 million to 51 projects, benefiting over 25,500 homes, farms, ranches, 
and providing over 40 million in middle mile broadband strategic planning and infrastructure grants. Now, Colorado's a little unique in this. We fund both middle mile and last mile projects because we see how critical cost-effective backhaul or cost-effective middle mile is to even allowing cost-effective last mile broadband. So we stand um, unique in that regard and um, it has benefited our state. Um, we are not willing to rest on our laurels. And in early 2020, Governor Polis asked the Colorado Broadband Office to convene a broadband working group of key state agency stakeholders to provide recommendations in the areas of broadband governance, data accuracy, sustainable funding, and future technology. As we undertook this task though, the pandemic settled in and our work um, took on a new sense of urgency as we watched our nation and our fellow Coloradans reliance on broadband um, access become even more critically linked to our ability to educate, um, work from home, uh, receive medical uh, services. So our office understood that broadband connectivity challenge was real because previously the CBO had estimated that approximately 85 to 90,000 rural Colorado homes lacked access to broadband. And that's based on 2010 census data. I think that number is gonna be larger, unfortunately, when we have new updated census data. So we knew the broadband rule, broadband gap did exist, but the homework gap became even more apparent to all of us because at the onset of our state stay at home orders, uh, the Colorado Department of Education conducted a survey and identified over 65,000 Colorado students that did not have access to broadband. And as the weeks turned into months, we all became painfully aware of that frustrations for e-learning healthcare and remote work. Um, because of our offices work in specific areas, we um, have points of contact for healthcare, we have points of contact with education and points of contact with our tribal nation. Each of my colleagues work very hard with those particular groups to identify projects and needs uh, for serving those communities. And COVID really made our um, tribal nations um, apparent need for broadband connectivity even more acute. And our offices work directly with them to secure uh, the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum uh, over their tribal lands and to identify shovel ready projects that we're in preparation for now. So they're ready when state and federal funding is available. So last year, uh, Governor Polis released, it was I think in late October, the Colorado, Colorado Broadband Initiatives Report. Now this report outlines the state's vision to create economic um, opportunities for Coloradans through changing how Colorado governs, maps, funds, and deploys broadband. The governor also signed an executive order creating a broadband advisory board to focus on collaboration and coordination of broadband efforts across Colorado and to develop a digital inclusion roadmap for the state in partnership with the state's Office of Future Work. In terms of emergency relief, our legislative leadership joined the governor last year in setting aside 20 million in state funding for student connectivity through the Connecting Colorado Students Grant Program. Now this emergency funding provided uh, to school districts um, encouraged them to work directly with ISPs in their communities to deploy hotspots, fixed wireless solutions or fiber to the home, whatever their community had available to us to be able to connect students and teachers to close that homework gap for both urban and rural students. We weren't just focusing on rural students. We were focusing on that connectivity that was so critical to, critical to our urban students as well. And for more permanent solutions, we turned our attention to working with our legislators and broadband stakeholders to advance legislation in this session that we're in right now that will direct Colorado um, internet service providers to provide granular broadband mapping data mirroring the Broadband Data Act that was passed last year by Congress we're also looking to streamline our state's last mile broadband grant program and to direct grant funding to um, chronically unserved areas throughout the state. We're also active as Scott was talking about in advancing broadband policies at a federal level. We work with organizations like Pew, uh, the NTIA State Broadband Leadership Network as, as Scott pointed out, as well as we were an early adopter and, and got into the NTIA's National Broadband Dap Mapping Initiative um, and we are also, we had worked with uh, Senator Bennett's office, our Colorado Senator Bennett, uh, to introduce the Bridge Act 
which got kind of the conversation started on standards for uh, providing state block grants directly to uh, states um, breaking the cycle of failed one-size-fits-all federal broadband funding programs. So in our spare time this year, we plan to double down on all of these initiatives to coordinate our efforts across city, county, and state recipients of the American Rescue Plan to leverage this historic funding um, to deploy broadband infrastructure that will benefit our communities for decades to come. So I thank you, uh, and I look forward to engaging with the audience and my colleagues today. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Teresa. Let's go ahead and turn now to Matt Schmidt. And Matt is, of course, as mentioned, the director of the Illinois Broadband Office. Uh, he's got a very interesting background of his own in broadband in Minnesota, as well as Illinois. Uh, over to you, Matt, to tell us a little bit about the current happenings in the state of Illinois. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to join you all today. And yeah, it's a trip down memory lane for both of us, I guess. Uh, uh, a lot of times I would I'd start these sorts of conversations talking about how we created our Office of Broadband in Minnesota. And I drove around in the depth of winter when school was canceled, telling people the importance of broadband back in 2013. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm no longer a legislator there and uh, really enjoying the opportunity in Illinois to stand up our own Office of Broadband and, uh, and uh, related grant program. One thing that we said in Minnesota, though, was that you've got to fund the fund. And at the state level, it's great to see offices of broadband, and it's, it's great to see the innovative approaches to uh, investing in, uh, in connectivity. Um, but if you're not funding the fund and putting serious dollars out there, uh, you're really holding yourselves back. And so that's why I was inspired in uh, the summer of 2019 when Governor Pritzker called uh, to, to fill a, a key role with their uh, office of broadband. Uh, he and the General Assembly had invested $420 million in broadband, uh, including $20 million for an expansion of their Illinois Century Network, connecting higher education and schools around the state, and also $400 million for what we envisioned to be a, a matching grant program administration at the state level. And so that got my attention for a guy who's been preaching fund the fund at the state level for so long. And it's been uh, just a sprint ever since. And uh, truly uh, enjoyable to see what other states have done uh, in the past decade, learn those lessons, apply those lessons in trying to stand up our own office. And um, we've got a couple of things going on here in addition to that broadband grant fund. So uh, we've got two rounds of funding. One has been put out. Uh, we announced last summer uh, $50 million, leveraged $65 million in non-state match for 26,000 new connections around the state. And so uh, we're looking forward to uh, uh, announcing a second round of funding early this summer. Uh, and I don't wanna make any news today, but uh, we do anticipate a big third round later this year and welcome any investment from the federal government along the way. And so hopefully we get to a question about that state federal partnership before we depart today. But in addition to that, um, we really value the opportunity to, to lean into the whole conversation about broadband, not only uh, access and infrastructure investment, but also the importance for affordability, adoption, and utilization. And so I know that this is nothing new to any of the panelists uh, that, uh, that are here with you today. Uh, so much familiarity. I think uh, we're really putting our finger on best practices at the state level, and that's so great to see. Um, but that being said, you know, we really take seriously the idea of working with communities uh, to develop capacity and, uh, and promote broadband planning so that when we have the broadband moment that we're witnessing right now, we're prepared to take full advantage of that. And so again, I hope we have an opportunity to talk about how the federal, state and local governments can, can partner with our provider community to take full advantage of this moment. But I think leaning into the opportunities for capacity building and planning at the local level is critical to that. And so states that are doing that, I think are gonna put their, themselves in a position to succeed. We're trying to do that. Uh, also, you see a lot of great uh, work out there regarding um, I think analytics and getting a better understanding of what's going on in our regions and our communities beyond simply the map and in uh, the basic access question. A decade ago, that's kind of where the conversation started and ended, access uh, and the map. And now you've seen so many states, and Scott, I, I really appreciate the work that you're doing with Purdue uh, on the, uh, Broadband Ready and also applying analytics. Other states are doing some great work in that regard, understanding where our communities, our regions are at uh, with adoption, with affordability, with use, identifying those best practices from one community or a region to the next so that we're able to put our state in a position to, to scale them up or replicate them in other areas. And so that's our own version of the Broadband Ready program that we have. Uh, that acronym stands for uh, Regional Engagement for Adoption in Digital 
social equity. And so you can see some supporting programming at the community level with our connected communities work in partnership with the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society. Uh, also that Broadband Ready program that we're partnering with the University of Illinois system and the uh, Illinois Innovation Network. And then finally, we're really looking forward to, uh, to establishing uh, a, uh, a digital navigator network across the state to help address that third leg, if you will, of the digital equity stool, digital literacy and know-how. And I think the, the pandemic has really you know, shown a bright light on the fact that many populations in our state uh, don't have the digital literacy skills to take full advantage of the internet or the computers uh, that they might have. Uh, and so that's something that we're looking forward to leaning into. Lots of great work around the country uh, in, in the states that we're, we're talking to here today. And we're really looking forward to, I think, pairing that investment in infrastructure with that supportive programming around planning, analytics, uh, digital navigator, and uh, digital literacy skill building. And so with that said, I'll catch my breath. I really look forward to this conversation and learning some great things from my, uh, my colleagues here today. So thank you. Uh, wonderful and great, great to talk about infrastructure and planning, marry, marrying those together and, and, and the other aspects. So let's, let's go ahead and turn uh, just, just to, to our, our uh, Washington DC neighbor here uh, in Maryland and in particular, uh, Rick Gordon, uh, go ahead and the, the, the floor is yours to tell us a little bit about the Maryland uh, program for broadband. Sure, Drew, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm an engineer, I need video or I need uh, uh, pictures to help me, to help me through. Um, so I am the director of the governor's office of rural broadband for Maryland. Uh, governor Hogan established the office by executive order three years ago. Um, well, actually now four years ago, time flies. And uh, I was hired in 2018 uh, for the, pro for the, uh, to run the program. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, error has been mentioned, uh, 2009, it was passed and NTI created the BTOP program. Uh, Maryland did receive funds for BTOP. Uh, you need to be careful looking at this. Some of these, uh, like the One Economy Corporation, uh, they, they are actually a nationwide uh, entity that uh, received an award. We didn't get $28 million for sustainable adoption for Maryland alone. Uh, but Maryland did receive uh, several awards and chief being uh, awards to the Maryland Broadband Cooperative for mapping and to the Department of IT for infrastructure. Uh, the mapping was created, but like many states, it became static at that point and uh, it is pretty much uh, it useless now since it wasn't kept up to date. Um, funding for infrastructure in Maryland was a little different from other states. Maryland created a consortium consisting of state, county, and private entities. Most of the funding went to middle mile projects. Uh, the Department of IT do it, build a network to service state facilities. Our, our counties and local jurisdictions constructed their own uh, rings and networks to connect their facilities. And the Maryland Broadband Co-op was part of it and created a middle mile network that crossed the state and is used for their members to in, for interconnection and backhaul. Uh, we did have one county that was a little different. Uh, Anne Arundel County actually built a last mile network uh, for their unserved households. I think it's one of the few and possibly only uh, last mile projects that uh, NTIA funded through BTOP. So uh, that was interesting. Uh, next slide, please. As I mentioned, uh, the BTOP program didn't really do much to help us uh, with our last mile problem. Uh, this is the FCC Form 477 data, of the unserved areas in Maryland. Uh, uh, it's uh, you know, quite telling that uh, when you look at this, where the rural areas are within Maryland. Uh, next slide, please. So some of, I, I'm sure that all of you have uh, had the same conversation uh, when I first took the office. I basically was asked, you know, why, why is this so hard? Why won't the providers do it? And, uh, you know, most states, Maryland included, want the ISPs to expand into, into unserved areas. Uh, ISPs in many of the cases are not interested. And it's purely because private companies need to make money in what they build. Uh, the return on investment or ROI has to be met or they won't, they won't construct. Their shareholders won't allow it. Uh, when you look at the costs, it costs between $35,000 and $70,000 per mile to construct. And there may only be 10 potential subscribers in that mile. Maryland's denser than a lot of our uh, uh, 
other than a lot of other states, uh, some states it's three to five houses, uh, potential per subscribers per mile. Then you realize that only 30% of those subscribers will likely take the service. So three or four households have to pay for that 35 to $70,000 construction costs. The numbers just don't work. Next slide, please. Uh, so what can we do? Uh, oops, sorry, I lost my note. Um, we can lower the investment required by the ISP and increase the subscriber take. Um, th these are the most basic things that will, inc that will increase the ROI for the ISP. Uh, grants, digital literacy to increase subscriber uh, take, and uh, digital equity to make sure that all households can connect. Next slide, please. Uh, so in Maryland, uh, the first thing we did was I think we're, I think you're one, so there you go, one slide ahead of me. Uh, Maryland created two grant programs. Uh, one, one is a smaller grant program for $200,000 grants. And that's really to connect neighborhoods. You have a neighborhood that if the local provider could get a mile down the road, suddenly you might have 35 houses in a uh, new development to serve. Uh, so, so what we're doing is really paying to stretch that line out, out to the neighborhoods and uh, to the denser areas. And uh, the second program constructs entirely new networks for larger unserved areas, uh, those big red blobs that you saw on the map. Uh, last year was the first year for full funding. Uh, we awarded almost $12 million for 24 projects. Uh, there were 21 expansion projects into neighborhoods and four infrastructure projects. Uh, this year we received uh, expansion program applications for seven and a half million dollars and infrastructure program applications for about $27 million uh, for a total of $35 million in applications. Uh, the ISPs are already asking about the 2022 projects. So th the program is working and the ISPs are on board with it. Uh, we do have plans uh, hopefully in, the next, in this next year to uh, start our digital literacy and digital equity program. Um, the uh, legislature is actually looking to uh, change my office from an executive order office uh, to codify me and uh, make the office a permanent uh, resident at the Department of Housing and Economic Development. And it will be renamed the Office of Statewide Broadband uh, that uh, will then have uh, responsibilities for our urban as well as the, uh, the rural areas in Maryland. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's where we are um, and i um, happy to be here and happy to continue the conversation. Thank you. Well, wonderful. And thank you very much, uh, Rick, for, for that description. Let's go right into uh, Bert Lam um, in Hawaii. Uh, let's turn it over to you to um, uh, be the presenter here and uh, give us your description of the state of broadband in Hawaii. Aloha, everybody. Uh, my name is Bert Lam. Thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me, Drew. And uh, I, I'm, I'm quite honored to uh, share this panel with uh, such an esteemed uh, gathering of broadband experts. Now, one of the things that um, I wanted to kind of give everybody a, a sense of is, you know, the, the situation in Hawaii. And, and unlike the other uh, presenters, you know, we are probably at the very beginning of our broadband journey. So, uh, why don't you go to the next slide? So when I when I uh, got the job in in 2018, <clears throat> you know, uh, like every other state, you know, we've been part of the uh, recipients of of ARRA monies. Uh, there was the uh, they they stood up a um, a broadband council, uh, but the council um, didn't meet very frequently. So when when I came on board in 2018, the um, Broadband initiative was was keenly focused around uh, looking at some key infrastructure. So, the key infrastructure that I was uh, trying to get some appropriation for was the uh, carrier neutral cable landing. And and what I came into the role realizing, uh, because my telecom background you know spans thirty plus years, is that uh, there needs to be a good understanding of the the connection between uh, Trans Pacific fiber cables all the way to rural broadband. And what uh, I'm, I'm sure everybody on this uh, 
uh, panel and, and uh, attendees realize that Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific. I mean, we are the outpost, you know, the furthest west uh, for the United States. And, and we aren't uh, uh, at the, uh, the benefit of, of um, you know, uh, neighboring states that we could, uh, you know, uh, leverage from. So we're pretty much on our own. <clears throat> and so connectivity is very reliant on this trans-Pacific fiber cables. Uh, there is the terrestrial backhaul, which, which is the on-island uh, fiber connections. Uh, you have uh, small cell uh, and wireless uh, connections that... Uh, uh, broaden that connectivity. And then, of course, you have inner island fiber that connects the islands and, and all the way out to rural broadband. So that's kind of the, you know, the narrative that I wanted to help our legislators understand. Next slide. So <clears throat> fast forward to 2020. And over the course of the time that I was, uh, you know, lobbying heavily for the carrier neutral cable landing, uh, we were unable to get any funding in 2018, 2019, or 2020. So I took the advice of one of my legislators and, and, said, and who told me, Bert, you got to really use the power of your office to convene. So what I did was I started to um, bring people together. And our first meeting <clears throat> for the uh, broadband hui was uh, back in March 25th, 2020. And that was a day when there was the, uh, you know, the stay-at-home order. And what we did was we recognized that, you know, there were students that now were all <clears throat> at home and the carriers were in a position to offer some sort of uh, discount. So we wanted to get the carriers and the DOE, our Department of Education, as well as other uh, education uh, institutions to kind of all be on the same page as to what was being offered. And, and so that was a start of what we call the broadband hui, which was a, a collective of, of uh, community stakeholders. So this is very, very grassroots. And, and we started off with uh, the wireline carriers. We started to expand it to the wireless carriers. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we included um, many of the, the nonprofits that were interested in, in extending connectivity to uh, enable not only distance learning, but uh, remote work as well as uh, telework, I'm sorry, um, telemedicine. And, and what started to grow was uh, interest in this, in this hui, which not only included these nonprofits and carriers and, and uh, community stakeholders, but also legislators as well as our congressional team. And so we went from, uh, you know, like a mailing list of about 25 people to now uh, <clears throat> 300 plus and and we promised to convene this broadband hui every week, every Wednesday. So in a, in a couple of hours, I'll be convening the 53rd consecutive meeting of the broadband hui. Next, next slide. So one of the things that we wanted to do, uh, you know, as a result of our sort of journey over these 52 weeks is really understand from a grassroots level, from a community level, what is it that we want to help achieve? And what we came up with was a guiding star that resulted in something called the Digital Equity Declaration. So we collectively came together and crafted what we refer to as this declaration. You can find it at uh, broadbandhui.org. And I'll have the link uh, at the end of the slide. And basically um, the, the intent of you know, this was to get you know, get something in place so that everyone could understand what it is that we're uh, trying to achieve. What are some of the goals that we're trying to achieve? And we, we focused the declaration on these three areas called access, literacy, and livelihood. Next slide. And the Digital Equity Declaration, um, as, you, as I mentioned, broadbandhui.org, uh, access uh, in terms of affordability, quality, broadband for all, literacy, a baseline, of digital competency for all and livelihood, recognizing that all of our societal systems uh, are basically based on, on digital technologies. And, and if we as a state and have our residents, you know, be uh, full participants, you know, we need to make sure that not only access is available, but uh, you know, the digital literacy and computer literacy is there as well. Next slide. And, 
This was also in conjunction with the uh, publication of our 2020 broad, broadband strategic plan, which uh, all kind of coincides with, uh, you know, uh, what, what we aim for. So again, you know, the four or overarching strategic goals include strategic robust broadband infrastructure, expand digital inclusion and adoption to achieve digital equity, enable Hawaii to thrive in a digital economy and strengthen uh, community resilience through broadband. So that's our, you know, we have a strategic plan. We have the digital equity declaration. Uh, and of course, uh, next slide. And, and what we are, you know, really uh, trying to prepare for is uh, to take advantage of uh, available federal funding that is coming coming our way. You know, we're looking very closely at, of course, the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act. Uh, and, and as we speak, you know, we're rolling out the, a local localized uh, outreach and marketing, ver uh, marketing effort to get as much participation in the emergency broadband benefit, uh, which provides a subsidy for Internet subscribers, uh, uh, whether they're um, $50 who, you know, that go to, you know, regular, regular subscribers and also a benefit of $75 that goes to Native Hawaiians on Hawaiian, Hawaiian homeland. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure that we can take advantage of, of uh, as much of the resource that the federal government is putting forward uh, for, for us in Hawaii. Next slide. And that's it. Mahalo is thank you in, in Hawaiian. And if you want to get more information, you can check out uh, broadband.hawaii.gov and uh, the, the work of the Broadband Hui, which is uh, uh, broadbandhui.org. And uh, available for questions. And uh, thanks again for allowing me to be on this panel. Awesome, wonderful. No, this is great. And we've had a super rich, and of course, this is just five out of 50 states and 56 states and territories. So so we're very, very excited to have all of you. And and so just two, two quick housekeeping notes. First, we do have links to Bert and Rick's presentations on the, the, the page for this event. We'll add the, the links to the Illinois, Indiana, and Colorado offices, as, as well as others for other state uh, offices that you'd like to send, send our way to drew at breakfast.media. Secondly, you know, we do pride ourselves on starting on time and ending on time, but this is, again, we have so many great people here, and I'm sure there's many questions. We're going to let this go a little bit longer. Obviously, everyone can leave when they need to at one o'clock Eastern time, but, but we're not going to, you know, religiously stop right at, at one o'clock just so we can have that further discussion. I've already put forth three broad areas of questions into the chat window. And again, I don't want to stop our, our attendees from putting your questions forward. I see many of you already doing that. But let me just start for one, you know, kind of the, the expression I'm thinking is, this is not your broadband map, your, your, your father's broadband mapping anymore, right? That may have been the purpose for state broadband issues, but it's clearly not the primary or exclusive or, or you know, purpose these days. So I'd love each of you to talk to what role does or should mapping and planning play in your offices? And in particular, you know, what advice would you give the federal government, the FCC now trying to implement the digital opportunity data collection, the NTAA, kind of sort of kind of mapping with some states, but not all. What, what advice would you give to the federal officials about interacting with states in this process? And let's just start in the order we, we spoke. So starting with you, Scott and Teresa, Matt. Sure, thanks, Drew. That, the, the mapping question is always one that's, uh, you know, has been an incredible challenge, right? And so we know now that the FCC maps are, are somewhat overstated due to the way that they determine, you know, uh, access at the census block level. One of the things we do is really try to encourage communities to engage their residents and businesses who know all too well at the street level by the household what exactly is happening in their neighborhood. And we try to, we try to, one of the tricks we use, I guess you could call it is, you know, in these communities where access is, is lacking, we hear a lot of frustration, right? And so what we try to do is, is kind of channel that, that energy that the residents have into creating somewhat of a neighborhood champion type of model where we have a, a person living in an area that needs access, they're highly motivated, they have energy and effort to put towards it. We encourage them to work with, uh, you know, not only their local officials and providers and, and someone like Purdue uh, University 
to kind of establish more of a local set of information and data that they know to be true and to put that through their local filter and knowledge base uh, in determining where their needs are from their perspective. And some needs may be greater, you know, maybe there are business areas or, or, or things that may require even additional speeds to, to be successful. And so we, we really challenge the communities to, to, to understand that identify that, work with key partners to, to refine that map. And now, you know, we're learning a little bit more. One of the one of the really kind of groundbreaking announcements that we saw in the last few months was, I think as Ajit Pai, the chairman of the FCC was was wrapping up his term, he, he introduced a policy that allowed some, some local governments and maybe even state governments to provide data on the availability at the local level. And so we're still evaluating that, but we really think those, the, the, you know, Local communities may know better than anyone what is happening, what's working, what's not working, and they're also equipped, hopefully with our efforts, to, to address those and advocate for those things through some of these new channels we, we talked about. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. And let's, let's keep, yeah. keep going and feel free to chime in if you have. If you don't want to, we'll get you in the next round because we want to get as many questions from, from each of us and from, from our attendees. So, uh, Teresa. Drew, I think, you know, I've got to echo some of the things Scott just said. I think, you know, the local level uh, information is critical. We, we learned early on that with our mapping, um, you know, efforts going back to 2005, we learned very quickly there was a difference between what customers were experiencing and what we saw on our map. And so our uh, GIS mapping team has engaged early on with uh, crowdsourcing, getting, um, getting information on speed tests directly from consumers. So on our website at the CBO, consumers can go on, put their address in, run a speed test, provide us the CBO with actionable information about what the actual customer is experiencing with regard to speed tests. We really see that relationship with the local uh, communities as critical and essential to being able to discern where broadband is and isn't in our state because those are your local champions. Those are the folks that are feeling the pain the most and they're the ones that need a voice. And in fact, in our uh, broadband last mile grant program, there is a space for local communities to provide input um, in regard to those applications for last mile grant funding. And I think it's really critical that uh, advice, what I would give is as you are implementing broadband grant programs for your state or the federal government should as well, you need to really look at having that, that consumer input because it is so critical because what most times all of our programs rely on is application, not allowing those grant programs to target funding to specific areas. And so I think it's important to have that local voice um, to advocate for the community's needs. Great, Matt. Yeah, just quickly, I would add here, I think that uh, in the mapping space, we've seen a lot of innovation and ingenuity at the state level. I think the local perspective is really important. I think this is one thing though, that our federal partners, if they did it right, could really contribute to the overall effort in a really meaningful way. A standardized kind of base or platform from which in states and localities can, can innovate off of. And if we were able to, to maybe shift some of that work from the state to the federal level so that we can rely upon that, that basic mapping uh, that's timely, that's accurate, that's granular, and that we can innovate off of that, I think that's the sweet spot in my mind um, on the mapping front. Um, from our standpoint, we look at you know, uh, essentially FCC Form 477 data that's provided to our mapping vendor uh, ahead of time. We've got field validation uh, survey work that, uh, that is another layer to that mapping. And then the third piece, we've got the, 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 the speed test data. And so I think there's different ways to get at what's the real state of affairs out there. Um, but I, I'd, I'd like to see, you know, stronger contribution from our federal partners on the mapping front. Rick and Bert. So uh, Maryland, some, some of you may know, has a very strong county government structure. Uh, we actually rely on our county jurisdictions to help with, uh, with uh, availability. With, and uh, so we, we don't really have a mapping program yet. Um, the smaller grant program that I discussed actually has the local jurisdiction as the applicant with an ISP partner. Uh, to allow the uh, the local jurisdiction really to focus 
uh, their efforts and, and uh, to kind of guide us where service is uh, desperately needed. Um, Maryland does have a speed survey, maryland.speedsurvey.org, uh, that, uh, that is, we just got started and is also helping us uh, identify poorly served areas. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll really just quickly uh, say that, you know, we are very, very interested in, in mapping. Uh, we are, uh, there's no lack of uh, data platforms that could uh, enable some of that visualization. What we really need to have happen is the programs that support the data gathering aspect of, of that data. And what we, what we don't have is, uh, you know, the ground troops that are able to do some of that data gathering. And, you know, you know, in my previous life, I was uh, executive director of uh, Hawaii Open Data. We were very keen on, on getting more data um, uh, made accessible. And of course, you know, we were doing a lot of hackathons and code challenges and, you know, things like civic engagement. And what, what I tried to do is bring some of that to the, the broadband effort that I'm involved in and, and try to get the community really to, you know, to champion the efforts to, to gather up some of this data. And it becomes really important because, you know, we, we not only can get uh, broadband data, but we can also look at getting um, digital literacy data, getting telehealth data and, and layer on top of that. So I really, uh, you know, cannot emphasize the importance of programmatic support for data gathering. Well, great. Uh, the second area of questions, and I'm gonna build on two that have been made through the chat and feel free to keep those chat questions coming. Um, uh, I want to ask really what advice you would give as the federal government considers a major infrastructure fund, right? So for example, Kevin Cloyne writes that um, New York State had a $500 million broadband grant program. What lessons have been learned from that program and, and your programs that might be applicable to the 100 million that I understand is being considered as part of the Biden infrastructure plan? And Building also on a question by um, Craig um, Hofferber, excuse me, Hofferber about um, breaking loose infrastructure funding from the federal budget for backbones for broadband backbone services, and and so I guess I guess I would just ask your thoughts on funding from a federal perspective. What are your thoughts on block grants? What are your thoughts on states and 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 state uh, innovative programs that you have done yourself? or you've been involved in. I'm gonna open this one up to whoever wants to go first. I'll just say my piece real quick. I think that we've got a, a historic opportunity here uh, for kind of recalibrating that state, federal, local uh, relationship and broadband. And so I really wanna see uh, the states uh, empowered. I think that we've come a long ways with our broadband authorities and offices over the last decade. I think we understand our communities, our states uh, better than the federal government does, frankly. And I think that we've got grant programs that uh, over time are being perfected. And so I'd love to see uh, uh, us maximize this opportunity for, for block grants to the states. And uh, I think that it, it really opens, I, I think, a new era of coordination. Uh, in programmatic investment across the board. I just, I can't, I can't tell you how difficult it's been to try to, to get a, a full view of the landscape with uh, different federal funding programs, in particular RDOF, with the uncertainty around that and trying to synchronize a, a state broadband grant program at the same time. And so I just think recalibrate that, the federal role of funder, state role of administrator and program design, I think uh, empowering those local communities along the way with their ideas. I think that's the way to, to move forward in my mind. I think the, the states have proven their uh, capabilities. They've, they've, they've got street cred now. Uh, over 20 states um, deployed over 700 million in CARES Act funding in less than nine months. Um, in my research and review of what state broadband offices are funding for last mile grant programs, it reflects the fact that many times on a per home path, state uh, broadband funds are, are able to deploy uh, many times the most expensive people say fiber to the home for less than $3,000 per home pass, but, and get that done in less than many times, 24 months, or some states require the implementation of those grants in less than 12 months. And when you compare that to what we see at the federal funding level with example, um, an example like CAF, that CAF was funding from the FCC 10 meg down now, and one the, meg up. The Connect, of, just to right. make sure everyone knows, the Connect America Fund, right? Yeah. The last round of, of, of auctions. So go ahead. Right. So um, when I, you know, to distill that, what I'm saying is states have 
cost effectively and efficiently deployed huge sums of last mile broadband funding effectively and efficiently. And we need to be given the opportunity to come up or to implement these, um, you know, a uniquely um, uh, crafted programs that fit the needs of our state. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, these one size fits all are really a struggle for states because situations like the Connect America Fund or ARDOF are raising all kinds of concerns in our states that we're not going to see funding for five to six to seven to eight years. So I believe um, as, you know, as, as Matt pointed out, we need to recalibrate who's, who's running the show here. We're happy to have federal guidance, but states are very capable of getting this job done. I wanna chime in here with uh, just a, a Hawaii perspective. And one of the really key infrastructure pieces that I have uh, advocated for and people who, who are asking me, Bert, what's, the, what's your top priority in terms of uh, some of this infra infrastructure funding? Again, I, I, I got to remind everybody we're in the middle of Pacific and, and you know, there isn't going to be uh, um, trans-Pacific fiber cables or Internet access if those cables don't land in Hawaii. I think there was a recent announcement by Facebook and Google that they're putting in um, a trans-Pacific cable between Asia and the West Coast and it's bypassing Hawaii. All of these trans-Pacific cables bypass Hawaii for the most part. And so if, you know, our feeling is that if we can get the cable landing station as well as uh, you know, the carrier neutral infrastructure in place that would help to lower the barrier for some of these trans-Pacific projects uh, going across the Pacific. And, and thanks to our congressional team and the powers that be, uh, they actually got the words in the, in the language of um, cable landing stations and, and some marine fiber cables uh, into the infrastructure bill as well. So we're very hopeful that we can, you know, get started on, on ensuring our robust connectivity. It, Drew, I think Matt um, mentioned partnerships, and I Maryland has worked really, really closely with uh, our local jurisdictions in the ISPs uh, for for reconnect the state, uh, Talbot County, and Eastern Utilities joined together to uh, to apply to USDA, and I think that that made a really big difference in how the application was prepared in the areas that were selected for service. So I, I think as uh, you know, as the federal government especially is looking at how to make things work, I was really encouraged to see uh, uh, the on the bus spending bill require partnerships as part of the uh, application process to NTIA for their $300 million uh, upcoming program. So I, I think partnerships are really important when, uh, when putting together applications. Scott is going to have to Scott is going to have to leave in, in two minutes here. So I want to give him a, both a kind of a final word and maybe just throw in a little bit about the partnerships uh, aspect <clears throat> and your view of that, Scott, before you leave. And we ask the, the others about that. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and I, I agree with Rick on the partnership front. I mean, we tell communities, uh, you know, you can't do this alone. Right. I mean, that is that I don't know that anyone can do this alone, including providers in many cases. Right. There are gaps in making this possible that can only be filled in certain ways. And so we've got two great examples in Indiana recently. Recently, the uh, Southern Indiana provider partnered with an REMC who partnered with the community who layered on a state grant to accomplish a huge investment, a very rural area that never would have been possible without that partnership. The other partnership that's just incredible, Wabash Heartland Innovation Network recently launched the nation's first broadband tethered aerostat. It's essentially a blimp and they're serving students and, 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 and many more with that through a partnership with a foundation, a health research foundation. And, you know, these new partners are coming to the table, would encourage anyone listening to really reach out to those folks, whether they be health or financial, business, you know, education or, or, or other, to, to pull them into this conversation. I think they're more eager than ever to participate and, and more impacted than ever. And with that, just want to thank you for having me on. It's fantastic to see the folks on the panel today. Thank you for pulling this together and look forward to many more uh, broadband breakfasts uh, in the future. Well, thank you, Scott. And as I said, we'll keep going just a little bit longer. I don't want to tax everyone's patience, but thank you for being with us, Scott. I want to ask the third question, again, build on some of the others that have been made. Take care. Build on some of the others that have been made about public private partnerships, right? And what is the role? Because to me, this is in some ways the heart of what an, a state broadband authority can do 
uh, if, it, if it kind of either is not constrained or has it in its mandate to do that. And by that, I'm thinking not just of the partnerships with the federal and state governments, mm -hmm. but you know, lots of private organizations like mm -hmm. Pew, uh, which has been referred to, the California Emerging Technology Fund has also gotten quite involved in this, in this project. There's countless private sector uh, entities, network uh, service providers that are very interested and willing to help uh, facilitate the, the rollout of, of broadband networks. And, and so I, I wanna just get your take, each of you on how you view the role of your state broadband authority in facilitating public private partnerships. Let's again, go in the order we've, we've been going. So Teresa, you get to go first here. So Drew, um, I've had a joke early on. The CBO is kind of like match.com for broadband. Uh, we really do embrace that concept um, of public private partnerships and matchmaking. Um, we take it to heart. And we have worked directly with you know, our local communities, our internet service providers, our cross agencies with our other agencies that touch broadband. But I think it's really critical. Um, we've also looked at creative things like looking at opportunity zones, bringing you know, angel investors into communities to invest in broadband infrastructures um, that you know, benefit the community and have great um, you know, impact to those communities but also uh, return a great uh, you know, investment return to, um, to potential investors. So it, it really, you know, when I say match.com, I'll probably get, uh, have to pay a fee for using that, that term, but it really does feel like that. We, uh, we try to put some of the smartest people in the room together and get them, they have the answers. The, you know, the local folks know what their communities need, the providers, I have experience in this. And, you know, for us, municipalities and, and co-ops in our state have taken the lead in deploying, you know, broadband capacity to the home. So um, we really, we believe in that, um, in that relationship building and embrace it um, in any creative um, uh, avenue that, that uh, affords itself, so. Yeah, I would just add to that. And I think this is all great insight. Um, quickly, I think the partnerships are the key. And so I look at it a couple different ways. One, you know, doing the deployments, you know, ideally we want to see the community involved in any deployment that's happening. And so we build that into our scoring with our Connect Illinois grant program, as many states do. Uh, and for communities that want to make investments, uh, making sure that they've got the, the technical chops and the know-how at the table. And so I think that that's one thing that we're intentional about helping communities talk to providers and, and telling providers they need to talk to communities. It's a two-way street. And so that's one aspect of that partnership um, uh, angle that we play. Also, I think from our standpoint, Office of Broadband is pretty lean operation in Illinois. We've got two full-time equivalents. Sound familiar, everybody? But we've got great strategic partnerships across the state. And I mentioned, uh, you know, Benton Institute for Broadband Society. We do some of our digital equity work with them. Also, the University of Illinois system, the uh, Innovation Network. Uh, so great strategic partnerships that allow us to extend extend our, our, our reach. Should mention University of Illinois Extension. If you've seen any webinars, they've hosted so many of them that we've been on. And so the point is, that's a great way of kind of putting together a team that's much bigger than your your current kind of FTEs. And I think broadband is just a great topic for that kind of collaboration because it touches so many aspects of our economy, of our government, of society. And so I'll leave it there. Partnerships are key. We need to see more of them moving forward. Great. Um, I was really struck by your discussion of uh, middle mile and last mile funding, right? And how, or, or maybe maybe someone else mentioned that too. I, Teresa did, but but I was just like really taken by your idea, Rick, of, of kind of working with the community to kind of, I don't know, you know, the state facilitating crowdfunding it, it almost in, in some ways is what it sounds to me. What are, what are your thoughts on that? And of course, this broader question of partnerships and how the Maryland, uh, the governor's office in Maryland that, that is now becoming statutory or, or legislative. What, what are some things that you have and want to do in this space? So when I first started the position within two months, I pulled together all of the county broadband people, which was mostly most counties, it was the IT director because they didn't know where else to put it and brought them into a meeting and basically said, you know, look, we are going to have a program. You guys need to get your act together. You need to figure out what you want to do and how you want to do it. Uh, some counties were, were all set. Other counties weren't. And we started talking and we actually funded feasibility studies so that they could get ready for the funding that was going to be coming out of the legislature and the governor's office. Uh, and that, that 
started the relationship between the counties and the state uh, as partners. And one of the things that the feasibility studies did, uh, the last piece was the county sent out RFPs to internet service providers to say, hey, we wanna tackle this project, we're looking for partners. And, uh, and so they were able to really establish relationships with their, with their ISPs, which as funding becomes available, they have that relationship. They don't have to sit back and try and figure out what they wanna do, where they wanna go. They're already talking about it. So that's where the partnerships I think are really important. Uh, it allows us to react, it allows them to react as funding becomes available. They, they've already given it the thought that's, that's needed as opposed, uh, I, I came from USDA and uh, I used the telecom program there. And I used to tell applicants or potential applicants uh, when, when the funding, uh, the, the uh, notice of intent to, to fund was released, it was too late. You had 60 days now to get an application in. You need to be planning six months prior to that. Uh, and that's how we, we kind of tackled it in Maryland is don't wait until funding's available. Up, you know, get, your, get your ducks in a row, figure out what you want to do now. And uh, I think that's a, a really important uh, way, to, way to go about it. Wonderful. Uh, Bert, what are your thoughts on this partnership question, as, as well as the question that was asked here by um, Pocket Batninger of, of STL Network Services about shortages of skilled resources and material? What role do you play or do others, other state broadband authorities play in helping to facilitate, again, these kinds of public-private partnerships? Thanks, Drew. Yeah, um, yeah so the panelists all, you know, said some very important things. And and I, I totally agree with the, uh, you know, the idea of, of trying to establish partnerships, especially in the middle mile. We're very interested in middle mile uh, options in, in Hawaii, uh, as well as uh, last mile uh, uh, opportunities. And of course, we're, we're actively participating and partnering with, you know, the Hawaiian Telecom and, and the charters. And those are the, you know, the big ISPs. And I've, you know, like I said, in a couple of hours, I, I convened the broadband HUI. Uh, we have already put the word out that, you know, they ought to be, everybody should be looking at what kinds of projects could potentially qualify for any of this federal funding. So I'm, I'm very much encouraging everybody to start now because, you know, when the funding becomes available, it's going to be a quick turnaround to, to get those proposals in. And then to answer your question about uh, uh, shortages, you know, we are very concerned that as much as this, as much as this money is really important, what is the capacity upon which any of those carriers can now deliver on deployment of infrastructure? And, you know, uh, you know, other states probably have fiber manufacturers right, right next door. We have to ship all that stuff in. And likely, the likelihood is that we're going to be uh, the low, you know, the low priority uh, customer when wanting to get some of this, uh, you know, uh, equipment and, and infrastructure deployed. So, and if I'm, I'm interested in trying to do this uh, fiber optic, uh, in, inter island fiber optic, I mean, I bet you, you know, there's a bunch of people um, putting reservations in for that uh, cable landing ship. So, you know, there's, it's going to be tough. I mean, the delivery cycle on any of this uh, is going to be very time dependent and we're going to need resources and equipment and supplies to to accomplish that. So, uh, again, Drew, thanks for uh, including me. I've got to run and and get to you know my my next uh, meeting. But uh, really appreciate you bringing us all together and 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 having the ability to to share with others some of our unique situations, uh, especially out here in the middle middle of the Pacific. So, well, mahalo. Thank, and thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you, Aloha, for that wonderful presentation. Let's go ahead and give others a chance to give quick final. Closing thoughts, uh, Teresa, uh, Rick, and then we'll let you finish for us, Matt, uh, about any final thoughts you have or any other questions you'd want to react to. And Bert, I guess I include you. Anything else you'd like to say, Bert, or you're good? Okay. Um, yeah. Teresa, go, go ahead and give us your, your thoughts about what, what we can learn from state broadband authorities going forward. Well, I think that we need to look at, you know, I've, I've, my, my colleagues uh, across the SBLN are at, SBL and yeah, network have, have we've really been advocating for, for things that bring down the cost, the capex of infrastructure, broadband infrastructure, so that the, the price associated with uh, broadband access is more accessible. And then we can deal with the issues 
of affordability, right? We need to, it is a two pronged uh, approach that we have to take. And so um, what we've looked at in our state is considering um, the concept of if companies are receiving CapEx or grant funding, that there should be some consideration for the provision of an income qualified tier of usable service. So there, there are a lot of Petri, dishes, uh, Petri dish ideas out there that we would like uh, to advocate um, and implement if given the opportunity to lead in this regard with federal funding dollars. As my, my old boss, Tony Neal Graves likes to say, the states can't print money, the federal government can. And we need federal funding to implement these really creative ideas that we have been successfully implementing in the states. And so I would like to see those Petri dish ideas um, have the funding to be implemented um, in an effective way. So uh, we, we've seen some real interesting things in our state. Um, uh, a rural electric co-op actually was part of a, or a group that repurposed um, coal miners that were put out of work when their coal mine or the coal uh, generation plant closed. They began, they were retrained as cable splicers. We're seeing roughnecks in the oil and gas industry be repurposed as, as fiber deployment or tower um, installation crews. We're working across our state agencies with the Department of Work, you know, and Labor um, to identify those creative solutions because like Bert says, we're gonna all have labor shortages to deal with and, and, and equipment shortages to deal with. And so we, the states need to be allowed to be nimble to implement uh, these solutions in a timely fashion, not five to 10 years in under right. 24 months. Wonderful, and thank you, Teresa. Uh, Teresa. Ken, Rick, and Matt, let's, let's hear your final thoughts and we'll thank everyone for being part of this discussion. I, um, material and manpower are probably one of my biggest concerns right now. Um, I'm actually talking with uh, two of our, what are an electric co-op and a municipal uh, electric company that are branching into, into uh, fiber and broadband service about developing internships and apprenticeship programs so that we can help try and feed uh, our other ISPs as, as it comes along. Um, that rural areas, it's, it's next to impossible to find some of the skill set that you need to, to build and operate these networks. So, you know, the, the manpower is really critical. The timelines that the federal government is putting on some of these dollars, I'm not sure that they realize that materials could be, by the time we get ready to start spending, materials are going to be a year out. So rather than having two and a half years to build, you're really going to be looking at 18 months. And uh, that, that's a really difficult problem to overcome. So hopefully the, uh, the federal government uh, looks at that and realizes that, uh, that they're, while they're trying to solve a problem, they're creating a different problem, so. Matt, the last word. Yeah, I would certainly um, you know, emphasize that we've got some lessons to learn from ARA a decade ago. And so uh, applying those wisely, I think is gonna instruct a, a successful outcome here. But I think just a couple of points to reiterate, um, it's all hands on deck if we're gonna seize this moment. And I think that truly means uh, having the federal government step up to play the role of funder and facilitator that we really rely upon our states that have de developed this uh, capacity and expertise over the last decade to administer uh, programs that are responsive to state and community needs and that we empower those local communities and our providers to, to know their communities and to have the right solutions, again, in partnership with states and in the federal government. And so all hands on deck, uh, I think it's going to take all of us to seize this moment, but I think if we're intentional about it and we're thoughtful on the front end, I'm really optimistic about where this is going. Well, wonderful. Thanks all of you for staying a little bit longer than, than we, we originally requested. On behalf of uh, Scott Rudd of Indiana, who's, who's left us now, and Teresa, Teresa Ferguson of Colorado, Matt Schmidt of Illinois, um, Rick Gordon of, of Maryland, thank you, and Bert Lum, who's uh, hopped off. I'm Drew Clark with Broadband Breakfast. We'll see you next Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern time for another episode. Take care. We'll see you.